Welcome and thank you for joining the Irrigation Association's 2022 Agriculture Faculty Academy, sponsored by both Rainbird and Senager. Before we dive into our first session, Introduction to Pumps, I'd like to take a quick moment to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, one, I have muted everyone by default, so we won't be disrupted by any latecomers. So please keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation unless you have a question for our speakers, as this will help minimize any background noise. Two, during the presentation, if you have questions, you can ask verbally by taking yourself off mute or via the chat box, which I will be monitoring throughout the session. There is also a raise your hand feature that you can utilize that we'll be keeping an eye out for as well. Lastly, we want to encourage interactivity during these sessions. So please feel free to have your video on for the session and to use the chat box and or the raise your hand feature to um, introduce yourself and just uh, connect with the group. So without further ado, please welcome our speakers, Bill Green and Kalmine Bang from the Center for Irrigation Technology, who are gonna take over their screen share now. Bill and Kalmine. Good morning, I'm Bill Green with the Center for Irrigation Technology. And I'm Dr. Kalmine Vang, the Interim Director for the Center for Irrigation Technology. And welcome to our uh, introduction to pumps workshop today. We're going to talk about some basic things when it comes to irrigation pumps. But uh, Dr. Vang is going to start with a, a, a few little items here. And uh, we're going to go to our PowerPoint to start and do a couple slides. And he's going to give you a little tour of the wet lab. Next slide. Oh, I got it. So a little bit about the Center for Irrigation Technology. The Center for Irrigation Technology has been in operation for over 40 years. Uh, we are, we have a sister company, the Water Energy Technology uh, Center that is located right here in our hydraulics laboratory, which is primarily utilized for developing startup business focusing on water and energy. Our hydraulics laboratory, however, has only been in operation since 2007. Uh, the university itself has over a thousand acres of farmland that we utilize to perform research and also it's actually an acting farm or a commercial farm that works and develops and, um, and also sells its product to, the, to people. Um, and then of course, uh, Bill Green and I work for the Advanced Pumping Efficiency Program, which includes a subsidized pump efficiency testing and outreach program. Um, pump efficiency program has been in operation for over 21 years. Uh, we've tested over 30,000 pumps at this point and done over four or 500 seminars across the state of California. The focus of the Center for Irrigation Technology has three. It's uh, research, education, and testing. Uh, we've been doing that for, for like, again, for over 40 years, and we've tested basically almost every product, water, energy, and irrigation related that has come through probably uh, come to fruition or even on the shelf that you see at the, the store or where you buy. Um, we do a lot of grant programs and education programs and outreach. So one of our other programs that we do here is the, for the Department of Public um, Pesticide Regulation, doing chemigation for specialty crops and other uh, crops, um, small and hard to reach growers. And again, our, we are under the umbrella currently of uh, California Water Institute which is primarily focusing on uh, water policy and education. We all have other, also have other institutions such as our IFA and our VERSI. And also, uh, we also now have a program that we brought back here to the California uh, State University of Fresno, which is the WRPI or Water Resource Policy in, uh, in Initiative. And that will be coming back here within the next couple of months. And that is a CSU wide focus on research, education, and policy development. And JJ. And then now we're going to give right you a now. quick tour. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so this here is our hydraulic laboratory. It's been out in operation since 2007. Um, we're gonna head this way. And if you wanna look, and since this is a pump and basic class, I wanted to focus primarily on the pumps here. So we have a 300 horsepower here pump. And these are all vertical turbine pump going down about 22 feet in our sump, which recycles the water. So we don't lose any water. 
And then on the side here, we have a 50 horsepower pump and also a vertical turbine. Uh, in interestingly enough, this laboratory was developed and built to mimic um, a pump testing facility that I used to work in. And now Bill's wife actually works for that same organization. So that's kind of an interesting fact. Uh, we have over, I believe, 8,000 or 50,000 gallons of water down here in the sump. It's basically a giant swimming pool. But then we are here, we have a centrifugal. And the centrifugal pump here is basically used as a booster pump and is boosting the pressure if we need to do it. To which we need to uh, go above and beyond a certain uh, pressure that we need. Um, our limitations here in the laboratory is basically we can do anything from zero to 6,000 gallons per minute and also basically goes from zero to about 200 PSI. So that is kind of our uh, limitations where we're testing and, uh, and researching in the laboratory. Now, researching in the laboratory, we work with a lot of standards organizations such as the International Standards Organization, ASABE, and of course, EPA and WaterSense, and with also the IA developing different protocols for you know, testing different features such as right here, we have backflow prevention, we have flow meters and other products. We test controllers and fixtures. We you know, get to do static pressure burst testing of different um, equipment and basically anything within the water realm, we kind of test. So our limitation is really limited by uh, imagination and what we can do within the lab, which is zero to 6,000 gallons per minute and also zero to 200 PSI. Um, over here in the back here, you will see that we have Venturi flow meters, which are calibrated. All of our equipment in the laboratory is calibrated to standard, uh, especially through, we are calibrated through uh, ISO 17025 standard. So we have Venturi flow meters, which we don't have to calibrate just because they're manufactured to be accurate to about half a percent. So our Venturi flow meters uh, will never have to be uh, calibrated because they're made of a material and also it will never uh, have to be Venturi meters uses uh, differential flow to measure so that's why we don't have to calibrate there's no moving mechanical parts um, we also have we also test filtration systems so we have a filtration system here uh, we test those as well and we test um, valves of course see valves uh, flow meters pressure gauges so we do a lot of different testing. Our testing here ranges from any of these products to also you know, testing things in the field. So we also do a lot of field research. We have six acres dedicated to just field research here at the uh, Center for Irrigation Technology. And that's when we can take the research that we have um, done in the laboratory and take it to the field to initialize it and make it uh, field ready. So that's how we do the evaluation and, and determination that the equipment or the uh, material that we're testing is field ready. Uh, now we're going to head back to the trailer and then we'll go from there. The, for the advanced pumping efficiency program, our main goal is energy and water use efficiency. So to save energy and to save water because they are interrelated. Uh, roughly in the state of California, roughly about 20% of our energy cost is to move water from one area to another. Um, our objectives are really to help our constituents get better and more efficient pumping systems into their field so that they can save energy and water and also to manage water, because you have to be able to uh, identify well, how much you're using to make sure that you're not overusing and that you're being efficient with the water. So those are our two objectives. Our subsidized program right now, we subsidize, subsidize any pump test of 40 horsepower or greater. The subsidized testing is $100 per pump test and $50 for an in-series booster pump. Uh, these are about every two years or 24 months. We also do technical analysis, so we'll help the customers identify 
how much they can save and how, how uh, efficient their pumps are working within their system. And then of course we do technical support. You can contact Bill Green, JJ Vang and Kayla. Um, we'll show our phone number and what, did we put emails? Emails later. And you guys can contact that, at that information again. And education is a big part of our program. Again, we, we used to travel all over the state of California and even sometime out of the state to do education program. Again, we do use roughly about 20 to 24 events per year through this program, but we have other programs that we have going on as well through other agencies. So PG, uh, this program is just one of our many educational programs. And this is one of our larger ones that we do for energy and water efficiency. And one sec. This is our turn my mic on again. Sorry, here's our contact information. Uh, uh, you know, our we have the 800 number. You can call us in the main office. So we generally have somebody answer. If you don't, you leave a message. We'll call you back as soon as we can. And we have our emails for a different to uh, different everybody that works in this particular program and at CIT. Uh, there's more people that work at CIT, but this is who works in the advanced pumping efficiency program. So I just thought I'd plug those in there real quick. And that takes us, I guess, to the meat of our project. So thank you, Dr. Vang, for helping thank us you. out there. And uh, I'm going to take over for a time being here. Uh, we're going to do a little, um, I'm here in front of the mobile education center trailer. And some of you that may have attended these irrigation association faculty uh, academy events have seen this in the past. Uh, perhaps we're going to do similar stuff today than what we've done before, but we're going to go a little more in depth because we have two sessions today. We have this first basic pumps um, session that we're doing right now, and then we have an actual um, uh, session on uh, VFDs. And so if there's any questions or comments along the way, you know, of course, you can raise your hand. It takes you to the front of the line, and hopefully you'll ask me the question directly using your microphone because it's always better to have a conversation. But you could, I'm sure Noreen could have you type it into the chat room and uh, and go from um, uh, have a, uh, questions go that way too. The problem with chat, uh, tight room, uh, uh, chat, typing it into the chat room or to your questions blocks, often um, uh, it it it's kind of hard to understand what the question was, and so that's why I was just uh, I prefer a one-on-one -on -one conversation if you can. But I'll leave that up to you. Anyway, um, let's go to our tour real quick. We're going to take a quick tour of this, and then we'll be showing different components individually uh, so that you have a better idea. This is the entire system here and water moves from the tank through the pump system around. We're pumping in a circle is what it amounts to. So let's start with a tank. It's over here in the corner. Very good. It's, you can see right here in the corner, that's a water tank. That's our water supply. We also have a smart meter and two variable frequency drives, one for each pump on this trailer here. We will be utilizing those in the next session. Uh, this first session is just basic pumps. We won't really be using the VFD, but we will look at our smart meter up close uh, a few times and take some looks at it, see how much energy we're using through our pump system. Water then flows into that plastic can there that I'm pointing at. There's a submersible, five horsepower submersible pump in there. And so uh, that's our main little pump. We kind of con consider that our deep well pump in this case uh, because it, uh, sh it shows... Um, or it, it runs the whole system. Uh, then water comes out and we have our chemigation valve there. Uh, important if you're injecting fertilizers or pesticides, this protect your water source, uh, particularly the groundwater source, but even any, I think you should protect any water source because if you backflow chemical into there, it could cause some kind of contamination or chemical spill. Water comes out of that. And then we have our pressure gauge right there. And you can see that has a transducer. Oops, back it up a little bit, there, Kayla, I'm sorry. Yeah, see at the bottom of it, the square box there, that's a transducer and it'll take the pressure signal while the water's running. You see it's at zero right now because I don't have the system running. It'll take that reading and send it to our computer so we can put feet of head there. So you, we'll give you a close up on the pressure gauge as we, uh, as, as we change things around and show you how that works. Uh, water moves on down the pipe then, and right now it's going straight down the pipe it comes around the corner here and then heads back this direction. We're going back towards the water tank now. So we've come around the corner and we're headed back this way. We have a, a flow meter here. This is one type of flow meter. We're not using this one today. We're just showing that you can have different types of flow meters. We're not advocating any brands or anything on this uh, uh, today. What we're do advocating is using technology uh, to monitor your pumps and do that sort of thing. We do that with growers all the time. 
there's hundreds of thousands of pumps running here in California, and a lot of them don't have flow meters and things. And so that's why we're advocating this. We have a second pressure gauge with transducer here. We have a couple transducers on it for different uh, possibilities we can use. This uh, pressure gauge here uh, is will show uh, additional pressure. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, we have right here our flow meter. Oop, what happened? Okay, a flow meter right here. And you can see the flow meter um, is right here. There's a propeller for flow meter in here. And when we run the pump, there you go. There's a close up. Thank you. When we run the pump, this will be turning. So we can show that. And right after it, we have this valve here. And this is just a hand valve, but it's our pressure regulating or flow regulating valve. And I can open it like that. And you can see the, the arrow turning here on top. And it's making it more open. Or I can close it, come back the other way and close it and create more pressure, less flow, things like that. That'll change the characteristics of our pump and how, how it's working. And then water flows from there on back to our water tank. Okay, so again, we're pumping in a circle. So we'll watch this. Now I can divert the flow and we'll do this real quickly if we have time, it's limited time today, we may not be able to divert the flow into this other system here into this end suction centrifugal or booster pump. And that's in series with our deep well pump. So we're showing an example of a deep well pump. And then additionally, we have a booster pump here uh, to create additional pressure. And that's why we have this second pressure gauge here because we'll have the pressure of the first pump and the additional boosted pressure from the booster pump. And, and it'll be showing up here and we can show those on screen. So all those things are working together. So that's our basic tour of the MEC. I wanted to give that to you first. And if there's any questions along the way, if you're saying, well, I don't really quite understand how that's working or what you're doing, please stop it, me and I'll explain it. We're gonna do a little bit of lecture here for about the next 20 minutes and, or so, and then I'll try to move right to our live demonstration. This is all live working equipment. We can display this with our computer screen, You'll see it go onto the big screen here and you'll be able to see what's ha occurring with that pump system as I change the conditions. I, I did want to point out that what Bill is demonstrating here is actually the same setup we have out there in the lab. It's just a smaller version. Right. It's almost exactly identical to what we have out there. That's, that's a great point. This, this, uh, the lab is a huge version of what we got here. And, uh, and uh, we are actually looking at maybe setting some of these things up so it looks more like a field installation because this little five horsepower pump is kind of small for ag installations. But anyway, it works for them making the point. So thank you, Calvin, you're right. Okay, so we got the tour out of the way. Let's go ahead and start talking about pumps a little bit. There's three major types of pumps basically uh, that you have. Uh, the first is a vertical turbine, this top one here where the motor's up on top. This is not the pump, this is the motor that drives the pump. It's part of the pumping plant but water and, and it turns this shaft here and the shaft and there's a bearings and stuff. And then down here you have your impellers and bowls and impellers. That's the actual pumping plant or the pump itself. But we consider the whole thing a pumping plant. So you have energy coming in here, it's transmitted through and turns this shaft, turns these impellers, water moves then as your cutouts, of course. The water moves through here and is discharged through the discharge valve. This is all a cutout here, so. Next, we have a submersible pump, which is what we actually have on this trailer. And you still have bowls and impellers inside each one of these. In this case, I have four stages of impellers. Uh, so it's four impellers in there and an electric motor down there. And all that electric motor is submerged in water with the rest of the pump system. So you don't have the motor up on top. The submersible pump spins at about twice the RPMs that the uh, vertical turbine does usually, generally, in most cases. Uh, but anyway, not always, but most of the time. And so, and also it's about 10% less efficient because the motor efficiency is less. And so vertical turbine could be about 10% more efficient. However, in many cases, submersible is preferable uh, for lower installation costs. On my own farm, I have a submersible pump because I don't have to worry about having an oiler lubricating the shaft or anything like that because it's all submerged in water and that, that creates its own lubrication. And then finally, we have the end suction centrifugal pump that again has an electric motor right here in this case. So power comes into it here. And then there's a short coupled shaft that ties to this, what we call a volute. And inside that volute right there is an impeller and that spins and water moves in and is discharged out of the top there. So that the volute is similar to a bowl. Uh, these are all turbine type pumps. Uh, so anyway, uh, just with centrifugal uh, force moving the water. 
Okay, so we are concerned about this in California because we have two problems we're short of is water and energy. Well, there's probably more than that in California now, but that are the two things that we are concerned about at the Center for Irrigation Technology and the Advanced Puppy Deficiency Program. So we were concerned about how efficiently we're moving that water because there's a lack of energy in the state and um, especially at peak times and stuff like that in the afternoons, we have major issues with uh, power and there's supposedly rolling blackouts going to be occurring this summer uh, because we don't have adequate power. Uh, we have good, uh, we have more than adequate in the afternoons because we have a lot of solar power out there, and that can be affecting our pumps and variable frequency drives. And I'm going to go into that, talk about that briefly later at our second session. But basically, we have the the efficiency of the pump, of the motor itself. Then we have the shaft and the bowls and impellers. You put that all together, we call that wire to water. So off the electric wire to water coming out of the pump wire to water efficiency or uh, overall pump efficiency. So that's a couple different terms, uh, horsepower in, horsepower out, things like that. So let's say, say usually the motor's using around 88 to 95%. Your transmission is somewhere um, in 90 to 97 if everything's working right. And hopefully if your bowls and pillars are working while you're in the 60s into maybe the mid to high 80s on some higher, bigger horsepower pumps. On this small horsepower pump, it's much less efficient. But I, I, get, I put an example here, 93% motor efficiency times 97, 95% transmission times 76 bowl. The OPE of a pumping plant then would be something like 67. That would mean excellent efficiency for an irrigation pump. As opposed to poor efficiency, I mean, we still might have 93 motor and 95 transmission, but our bowl efficiency, this part right down here, or impeller efficiency too, you could call it, that's what tends to fall off. And so it's, let's say it's fallen off for various reasons I'm gonna demonstrate here to 52, you put all that together, now you're down to 46, which is considered poor. And so that's why we're concerned about it. And the farmers are too, because they're trying to move water with the least amount of energy costs. And they wanna see something like this. They don't wanna be way down here or their energy costs are gonna be much higher. Not to mention the pump has probably fallen off in performance and we will demonstrate all that. So that's why we've always been most conservative of the bowls and impellers, because that's where we gain the most efficiency, generally speaking. You can go from an old standard high efficiency motor to a premium high efficiency motor. You can gain, gain three or four percent, five percent maybe. But look at our impeller efficiency, what we generally gain. That's because when pumps come through our program, we see bad pumps often and they need to be improved to become good pumps. Now, there's three main types of impellers, and I'll do a little bit of if we could do a close up on me here. Um, I'm going to show those three types of, well, two of the three anyway. Where is, ah, here we go. First is called a radio or closed impeller, and it's totally enclosed, enclosed here. Water comes in and is emitted out of the impeller. It sits in the uh, bowls and impellers like this and turns. Water comes in, water goes out, and is thrown out of there. This is, uh, this is probably the most common one we see now on the ag because this creates more pressure and we have greater lifts now that water levels in our drought conditions in California, water levels are dropping. So we're having to lift water farther from underground. So this is probably the most common impeller you see. But we also sometimes have this type of an impeller. And this is called a mixed flow or radial um, I'm sorry, radio is a closed impeller, a mixed flow impeller, I shouldn't say that. Um, and it sits in there and water comes in and then is thrown out of there. Uh, this is very adjustable, but it's a different type of impeller that you commonly see in ag sometimes. Uh, not as often as the other ones, but they're still being used quite a bit. And these don't cre create quite as much pressure. There's some efficiency differences and stuff too, but there's, those are just generalizations. There's thousands of different ways impellers are made and designed to create whatever conditions, and we call those operating conditions of flow and pressure you require out of that pump. So that's why there's different types of impellers. Let's go back to our PowerPoint real quick, and I'll show those impellers later and while I'm doing some demonstrations and stuff. Oh, sorry. Sometimes I grab the mouse here and mess her up. Okay, so there's a radio or closed impeller right there. That's the first one I showed you. And then we have a semi-open or mixed flow impeller here, okay. Actually, I had it upside down when I was showing it. <laughs> That's not too good, but anyway, <laughs> anyway. And then finally, we have what we call an axial impe uh, impeller, but it's more like a boat propeller. It's kind of an open, it's called open, axial or open impeller. And this is for low lift situations, high uh, volume. And you, you see this in, sometimes in agriculture 
when uh, they've got high flood conditions or trying to flood a field, say a rice field up north coming out of a canal or something like that, sometimes you'll see this type of impeller or coming out of the river or something where they don't have much of a lift on it. Uh, and it's, and, uh, but they're trying to get hot, large volumes of water fast into the field when they're trying to flood a rice field, for example, or something. And they're used in other situations too, if you're trying to flood a pond or something, but you don't want to have much lift on this. You don't want to have to lift the water very far because it's not going to do it efficiently. So those are three main types of impellers. We had three main types of pumps, the vertical turbine, the submersible, and the end suction centrifugal or booster pump. And then we have the three impellers. We have the radial or closed, semi-open or mixed flow impeller and the axial or open flow impeller, okay? So how do we choose what pump to put in or what pump we need to do, use to, for our farm? You know, there's a couple different pictures here. We have a vertical turbine pump that's a deep well pump here that's just on a couple of wood blocks that's dumping water. It looks like into a canal that's being delivered elsewhere. And then on the right here, you have a big old submersible pump right here you can't see the pump because it's down submerged in the water, but that's what that is. It's coming out. looks like more of a municipal water situation, but this could be because it looks like a filtration, large filtration system in a city or something, just a different type of pump. Those are also used in agriculture. So, well, when we're trying to put, uh, choose what pump to, we need, we need to know certain things. And that takes us to the horsepower in equation or the equation that you is use when you are uh, deciding to choose what pump. We need to determine how big a pump we need. Well, first off, we need to know our flow rate. So horsepower in the energy in to run the pumping plant and what pump we choose, we need to know what flow rate we need in gallons per minute usually is the way we're gonna do it. And we'll demonstrate here, gallons per minute. We also need to know our total dynamic hit or TDH of our, basically this is the pumping pressure or lift of the pump. Where's the water come from? Is it from deep underground? Is it out of a canal or a pond or reservoir? Is it out of a water tank that's up higher and, and that gives us positive pressure? All that goes into that calculation for TDH here. And we do that in lift in feet. And I'll, I'll show that in a few minutes. And then we have a constant 3960 that's, uh, that takes it and shows us how horsepower is, it comes out of this equation. And finally, we need to know the efficiency of the pump. So if we're installing a new pump, we can guess that we're gonna be 60% plus, hopefully if it's designed properly and everything, and we can plug in all those numbers. And I'll come back to that equation a little later with an example, but that's the equation that we use all the time when it comes to our pump efficiency testing, our demonstration here with the MEC, all these different things. We have, we have, we are using flow, we're using total dynamic head, which is pressure uh, converted to feet. And I'll show that in a minute. And then we know the, we have the efficiency of the pump. Um, if we don't have the efficiency, we have the horsepower in because we have the energy in off of our smart meter here and through our VFD, so we can utilize that. And I'll talk about that too. So what is the operating condition? That's a combination of flow and pressure that you're having to develop to run your system. You see a golf course pump here, it's squirting out sprinklers hundreds of feet, could be a sprinkler system in an agricultural setting. When you have to create more pressure to run something, it takes more energy. And so we call an operating condition, the combination of flow and pressure that's being developed as that pump is running. So you see a single sprinkler here, there might be multiples running, but every pump has that combination of flow and pressure as it operates. So sometimes you have more flow and less pressure. Sometimes you have more pressure and less flow, but always a combination of those two things. So what is flow rate? Flow rate, we're gonna talk in about terms of gallons per minute. Here's a picture of that pump I showed earlier, dumping the water in the canal. How many gallons per minute are coming out of there, out of that pump? Um, it could also be cubic feet per second. That's just a conversion. We're gonna use GPM or gallons per minute today that's coming out of the discharge in this case. And that would be measured by a flow meter and you can't see it very well, but there is a flow meter on this pump right here. And so that's very important to have. And we have our own flow meter that we'll be utilizing. So how do we get flow rates through those flow meters? And we are one of our favorite sayings here at CIT is you got to measure water and manage water. In agriculture here in California, uh, when I started this job about 20 years ago through APEP, uh, it was estimated only about 10% of ag wells had flow meters. And a lot are going in now. I think we're up to 30 or 40% of ag wells. That means still 50 or 60% or 70% maybe don't have them. We don't know the exact number, but they are becoming required through, uh, because of the drought and through the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, we are gonna be required to have meters on all our pumps eventually. And you have to be able to monitor and tell somebody accurately how much flow is coming out of it. 
We can get a, a, a flow rate also from a pump test when we do that, but that's a snapshot of that day only. It doesn't tell you what's going on, if the water levels are changing or if there's other issues. The second thing we need to know is total dynamic hit and feet. And total dynamic hit is basically the lift. So you see here's a booster pump or in suction trifocal. It's actually above the water. So you have a suction lift here, but you see you have your water source on the left and you got water comes in through the screen here. Hopefully it's not plugged up or that causes losses. And then you have losses as you move, as you move through here because you have friction through the pipe. The more flow you try to put through a smaller pipe, the more friction you're going to have. Then you have your discharge coming out of the pump that's coming up and it has an elevation lift up the hill here. That takes energy to do. And then finally, you have to maintain system pressure once you get it there. What, if you're running a sprinkler or a drip system, if you're flood irrigating, you don't need any more pressure at that point. But you've had to lift the water from over here where the water level is up the hill and you got to account for all the losses throughout the system. So we're going to convert pressure to feet because uh, we part of the equation there showed we had to have pressure. So basically to do that, we multiply by the constant 2.31. This is at sea level, but it's close enough uh, here in the valley in most of California. It may change if you go high up into the mountains or something. Uh, 2.31 equals one pound of pressure. So if you filled up a container 2.31 feet deep, it would equal one PSI. And so that's how we do total dynamic head when we're trying to decide what pump we need to do is we take whatever pressure we need and we add it to the feet of lift and that gives us that. So here's an example of that same diagram we showed before, but now we've thrown some numbers on it. Let's say we have a 10 foot suction lift, 10 feet we have to have a suction lift till we get it up to the center line of the pump. And then let's say we're lifting at an elevation lift of 190 feet. So that would be the 10 foot of suction lift here, 190 feet of elevation lift. Now we've lifted the water 200 feet. We've looked at our charts and all the different things. There's all these uh, things, an irrigation association through their certified irrigation designer and, and all these different things that you do. You can figure out how much pressure loss you're going to suffer through this pipe, depending on the flow rate and the size of the pipe and turns and things like that. Let's say we've done all that and we're going to lose 20 pounds of pressure from here to this pressure gauge over here so we're running that sprinkler system well to convert that we again we use that constant i just showed you 2.31 20 times 2.31 equals 46 46.2 exactly but 46 being close enough for our measurement and then let's say once we get to that point for the sprinklers we need 60 pounds of pressure to run the system well to pressure maintenance then we need 60 times 2.31 would be 139 feet then you add all those together, 10 foot of suction lift, 190 foot of elevation lift, 46 feet of friction losses, 139 feet of pressure maintenance. So the total dynamic hit in this example would be 385 feet, along with whatever flow rate has to come out of that pump. And if you have more TDH or more flow, it's going to take more horsepower or more energy. So you want to do it as efficiently as possible. So this is just one example. On my own farm, for example, I lift the water from the water source about 100 feet. And then I have about, um, there's some friction in there, about uh, friction losses of about 10 feet or so. So that's another 23, that's 123. Plus I need 20 pounds of pressure to run my drip system, uh, which is 46 feet. Uh, that's about like 170 feet of total dynamic head onto my pump, along with a flow rate of about 270 gallons per minute. That's how I figure uh, my operating condition of my particular pump. There's pumps manufactured for all different types of operating conditions and, and anything you can imagine. So I just want to give this quick primer on flows and pressures and pressure and TDH are the same thing. It's just a different word for it, but we have to convert pressure to feet of lift when we're doing these calculations. And this is how it's done in America. If you're in a, a metric system somewhere else, uh, it could be done in, in the metric system instead. Still, there's charts made for all that. It's just different to uh, different things. Here's a, a deep well pump here, a diagram of that. You have your discharge pressure. You have your static water level here. This is where the water is before you turn the pump on. You pump, turn the pump on, it draws down to the pumping water level down here. And all that has to be taken count into a deep well. So for example, let's say we're at 200 feet here for static water level. This is the same chart again. And we know we have 100 feet of drawdown the actual pumping water level is how far we have to lift to the surface. It really doesn't matter where it started. It matters as it's running. So we're going to look at it as it's running. So we have a 300 foot lift here before it discharges. In this case, just an open discharge, maybe into a, a reservoir or something like that. 
probably have a different pump that picks it up and takes it out to the field for pressurized irrigation. It could be set up where it's directly tied to the irrigation system. That's how my pump is set up. But sometimes you have a separate booster pump doing that work. Anyway, there's all these different ways of going about it. I just wanted to show then again, 300 feet of lift here is the example. Now, the third thing we need when we're doing, when we're looking at um, uh, efficiency of pumps and things like that is, is the energy in component. And we've got a smart meter and we'll do a little quick close up here of it. We have a smart meter here and we'll be able to show you when I'm running this pump, how much energy we're using. Because all we do is take that horsepower in equation and we reverse efficiency for horsepower in. We'll be able to tell because it have KW in and we'll be able to convert that to horsepower in. That is how we're going to get our third thing that we need for efficiency. So I'll demonstrate that also too here in a few minutes. Oops, sorry. Okay, so it's a smart meter and it shows how many kilowatt hours in this case. And then it scrolls through and puts kilowatts on there too. So this takes us to the next thing when we're trying to choose our pump is a simple pump performance curve. And this is one here uh, that shows the combination of flow and total dynamic head developed. So in this case, our flow rates on the bottom, take this axis down here, zero to 900 gallons per minute. And up here, we have our total dynamic head. And this example, this is just a fictitious pump I made up on my computer. I'll guarantee you one matches it somewhere because there's thousands of different pumps made for every application almost imaginable but it goes zero to 250 feet ahead. This is our curve right here. So wherever we intersect on this line is our pump curve was the operating condition this pump will create. So at 500 gallons a minute, it's about 145 feet of total dynamic head. You go right on the curve to 700 gallons a minute, it's only about 100 feet. You notice that's more flow, less pressure, less total dynamic head, okay? It's only 100 feet. Or conversely over here at uh, say 300 gallons a minute, we're at about 175 feet of total dynamic head, more pressure or more lift, less flow, but always a combination of those two things. So this pump will create a lot of different conditions. However, when it comes to efficiency of the pump, and this is impeller or bowl efficiency, this is not overall pump efficiency, we need to add in those numbers. And this pump was designed to work best at about 500 gallons a minute with just under 150 feet of lift. It's at 80%. You move right on the curve, efficiencies drop off. You move left on the curve, efficiencies drop off. We call this the best efficiency point or sweet spot on the curve. And this is important to know for every pump. That's why pumps don't stay it's the same efficiency all the time because water conditions change, how you're irrigating changes, things change and you start moving around on your curve here. And that's why I wanted to show you this because when we start this pump in a few minutes, I'm gonna have a pump curve on, this, on there to show you, okay? And that goes along with this. So here's an example back for a horsepower in equation. Let's say we know we need a thousand gallons a minute of flow rate, 300 feet of lift. We have our constant of 3960 and our efficiency is at 65%. We plug in all those numbers here equals 400,000 divided by 2574. The horsepower in on this example would be 155.4. So you choose 150 or 160 horsepower pump to create what you need. You might even go a little bit higher, but you're probably going to load up 160 horsepower pump and that'll give you adequate horsepower, a little extra. You always want to put a little extra in when you buy it. That's how we use the horsepower in equation, but I need to know where my water's coming from, how much flow rate I need, how much pressure I need, and we can estimate the efficiency. Hopefully this pump's in good shape when they first put it in. That's what you're going for. So I've gone through that very quickly. Usually you're getting the quick version today. Usually these classes take a couple hours and I spend more time describing what we're seeing. Hopefully I'm not confusing you. I guess there's no questions yet. So I haven't, either I'm confused you or I have total baff, totally baffled and you're just kind of saying, well, let me see if I can figure it out from here. We're gonna do several examples using our uh, pump system here now, uh, showing different things. We're gonna start with a variable or fluctuating water level. Oop, can you go back to that please? Then we're gonna talk about stable water levels. We're gonna talk about pressure loss or head loss, pressure loss through the system. And we'll be doing that through our valve and things. We'll show an example of when impellers get worn out, when pumps wear out, what happens to them? What happens to their conditions? We'll talk about excessive drawdown a little bit or specific capacity. That's when your well is plugging up. It's not the pump maybe is the problem, but the well is plugging up, the well screen. That can be a problem and cause additional issues. 
And of course, if water levels are changing uh, with the drought and stuff, and they do change, uh, that's called a variable or fluctuating level, that's the thing. And then I'll demonstrate pumps in a series real quick, probably not pumps in parallel, I'll just describe it. So, okay, now let's go to our um, MEC. And my computer went to sleep, of course, while I was talking, so let me get that going again. All right, now let's look at our, I gotta get my other mouse going here. There we go. Let's put this uh, screen, uh, uh, let's put the, um, no, let me, let me start the pump first. Okay, let's start the pump first. You can't see it yet, but I'm gonna hit a start button on this screen here. And we'll show what's going on, then we'll go to the screen, I'll describe it, that's a better way to do it. Okay, I just started this submersible pump right here. And you can't tell that it's running, but look at our pressure gauge up there. Starting to show a little pressure. I think it went up to about 11 pounds of pressure. There you go. So there's pressure in the system. Let's go back to the bigger uh, picture. Then water's coming on down the corner around here. It's coming around the corner. You can also see 11 pounds pressure on this uh, pressure gauge here too. You can get a close up on that. Good, about 11 pounds pressure. That's what's here currently. Then water comes down here to our flow meter. And it's probably hard to tell, but that propeller's turning. I'll show it when we slow the pump down. I'll slow the flow rate down. You'll be able to see it. But you can see the it's registering about 160 gallons a minute or so on this right now, something like that, on our, our uh, propeller flow meter here. There's a lot of different kinds of flow meters. Again, I'm not advocating anything. I just like this one because it's a visual of the propeller turning when I slow the flow down because all I have to do is close this valve and I'll slow the flow, increase pressure, right? Changes the conditions of the pump. And then water's flowing back to the, um, back to the tank. Now, additionally, let's look at our smart meter real quick. All right, we're gonna let it scroll through here. And we'll get you an example. There's kilowatt hours. That's the total energy that's been supplied. And here's kilowatts. It says 4.45. That's how much energy we're pulling with this pump right now. Now that's equivalent to about six horsepower. It's uh, kilowatts divided by 0.746 equals horsepower or horsepower times 0.746 equals kilowatts. So if you like to think in terms of horsepower, which most farmers do, I'm a farmer, that's the way I think. Kilowatts energy doesn't mean that much to me, but basically three quarters of a horsepower is a kilowatt. Uh, so if we're pulling 4.45 right now, we're pulling about 5.9 horsepower. Now I said this was a five horsepower pump. The reason it's pulling more than five horsepower, it's pulling almost six, is because of the inefficiency of the motor. But water horsepower coming out, I guarantee is less, five horsepower or less probably. So anyway, okay. So let's go to our, uh, our main screen now on the uh, computer. I'm gonna show you that what's going on with our pump currently on our pump curve. All right, as you can see here, we are way down on the right side of our uh, curve down here. That's because I got this basically wide open right now. Our, our flow rate, you can see it right there, is running about 154 gallons a minute. See the numbers bounce a little bit. That's our transducer sending the signal to the computer and they, the numbers bounce slightly, but they're about in the range of 154 approximately right there. Our total dynamic hit is only running at about 25, 26 feet. Well, what did I say the pressure was 11 pounds? If you multiply by two, maybe it was 11 and a half or 12, I don't know. But if you multiply it by 2.31, that's where we get total dynamic hit. So that's coming off the pressure gauge that says 11 or 11 and a half, 12 pounds, whatever it says, times 2.31. That's how we get total dynamic hit. So that's the actual pressure of the pump right now in terms of feet of lift. So it's kind of like right now, this pump is lifting the water 26 feet and dumping it out and it's flowing 155 gallons per minute. It's a small pump. So now these bar graphs show the same thing over here. 155, 156 gallons of flow rate, 26 feet of lift. And our efficiency is being computed because we're taking the energy into the pumping plant right now. And we're getting that in kilowatts, which is 4.45 converted to horsepower. We just reverse that equation. And that's where we're getting 
um, our efficiency number from. And I'll show that again if we have time at the end. We're going to run out of time if I'm not, don't keep going here because we only got 15 minutes. So, okay. We're also getting a pumping cost. Now, this is based on numbers I plugged in down below here. Now, I've plugged down, a, I'll highlight them on the bottom left here. If you see my cursor right there, is first it says optimum OPE. And it says 55%. Well, that's where I would hope this pump would be if it's working properly, this small submersible pump, 55%. We're not, we're at 26 right now. So we're not in a very optimal point. I've also plugged in right here, 19 cents per kilowatt hour. The second thing here, that's basically the off-peak cost right now that I'm paying on my farm to Pacific Gas and Electric here in California. 19 cents a kilowatt hour. On peak is running more like 30 cents, 32 cents, something like that. So five to eight in the evening, seven days a week is on peak in California now. It used to be from noon to six, Monday through Friday. But because of all the solar that's been installed the last few years in the systems, um, they don't need uh, as they have more than enough energy in the afternoons. What we don't have enough is in the evenings when the sun starts getting low on the horizon and it's hot still and everybody's turning their air conditioning on, that's when we have the critical time. So they want people to shut off their pumps during the five to eight period. They want you to shut off everything at your house and everything at that point, because that's when we're short of energy. We got plenty of energy. And then at nighttime, not as much energy is used because the sun goes down. We don't have as much air conditioning running. Businesses are closed and stuff. So it changes. So I just wanted to point all these things out. Now, the other thing about this is we're only about 26% efficient and 55 is the right one. But remember, every pump has a best efficiency point. So I'm going to plug those numbers here. And as you can see right here in the middle, the highest efficiency point is 78. Now that's bowl and impeller efficiency. That's not overall including the motor and the shaft and all and the cabling and all that stuff. So I'm going to work this pump up by closing the valve. So I'm going to walk over here and you can do a close up on the valve real quick. All right, and I'm gonna close this valve. Now watch how the, the line works up the pump, the, the uh, pump curve. Okay, so I'm closing the valve, I'm creating more pressure. So right now, whoop, I lost my, I messed up something here, didn't I? As we creep up to that best efficiency point, now I'm at 53, we're almost there. We're at about 120 gallons a minute with 75 feet of lift. You see, I've changed the conditions and you see our pump cost has changed, but I'm still not up to the 55. Let's go on up to the most efficient point approximately. It's interesting, our pump is actually working a little above the curve today. Yesterday it was right on the curve. So it changed up and we're actually a little better efficiency than what we have as our optimal. We're at 57% today. This pump's kind of old now, kind of like me. Sometimes it works better in one day than it does the next. So, all right. So let's look at our chart here. What are we at? We're at about 103 gallons per minute, 102. The numbers are bouncing around. We're at about 94 feet of total dynamic head. You see we're right close to our most efficient point here. You see our bar graph here shows 140 gallons a minute with 95 feet head and it shows us at about 56, 57% efficiency there. Then our pumping cost is running about 32 bucks, which is slightly better than our optimal. Now I could say, well, now we got a new optimal. Let's change the optimal to 57. Let's do it. I can change that. Now look at our costs, they're the same, $32 and $32. The number's changing now, it went to 58. Boy, this pump's doing good today. Anyway, you can see they're about the same. So let's say this is a deep well pump. We're gonna demonstrate a variable or fluctuating water table. And what we did here is we, we, we set this pump in a few years ago 
in a deep well and we're lifting the water uh, 95 feet to the surface and we're getting 103 gallons a minute out of, at efficiency of 57 for a little submersible like this that would be excellent and it's costing us about 32 dollars an acre foot off peak if we go on peak that cost goes up a lot but we're off peak right now i plugged that number in up there at the top showed about 57 percent efficiency at that point and i'm going to show what's happening now in california and many places across the united states we're having aqu aquifer overdraft going on not adequate recharges happening. This is happening in the Midwest, the Ogallala. This is happening here on the West Coast in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, Salinas Valley over on the coastal regions, uh, other places too. Other areas, maybe not so much. Maybe if you're from Washington State, that isn't a bit, as big a factor. Maybe the water levels are staying very high. But in this case, we're saying the water levels are changing. So I'm going to close my valve. By the way, we can go close up on this flow meter here real quick. There you go. You might be able to see it turning now because it's, it's a little easier to see. Kind of not the bright, not real bright. All right. Now, let's say this is a variable or fluctuating condition. I'm going to close this valve now. You can go to the valve. All right. I'm going to close this valve some more. All right, so I went from 95 feet to about 124, 125 feet. It's like the water level dropped 30 feet. We got places here in the valley where it drops that much in, from April through August or more. But I'm just saying this could be over a several year period, and this is what's happened in a lot of cases. So what's happened to our flow rate? Well, it was at 104 gallons a minute. Now it's half that. We added 30 feet of lift and our efficiency dropped off because we're no longer on our most efficient point. We moved way left on our curve. And look at our pump cost. If I plug that in, let's compare them now. We got 45% efficiency. We're off 20% on efficiency. Our costs went from 32 to 54, increased dramatically. And our irrigation system that required 100 gallons a minute or 103, is now only getting 51, so our irrigation system is not working very well. We're not supplying the proper operating condition, the flow and pressure that an irrigation system requires. Every irrigation system pressurized one has one. So this is an example if the water level is fluctuating or varying. It's, in this case, it's an example of the water level dropping in the deep well. Now, we, if we have a wet year next year, I open the valve back up, maybe it recovers or it recovers in the springtime. But a lot of times we never quite recover to where we once were. And especially over the period of several years time and several years of drought, this is the problem with a fluctuating situation. So that's why a lot of pumps that were installed several years ago now aren't operating on their most efficient point, aren't operating with the right flow and pressure anymore because the water levels dropped. It's a variable or fluctuating condition. Now, let's say we had a couple of wet years and it comes clear up. Now, you notice our efficiency is not good here because we're not on the most efficient point. We're getting a high flow rate now, higher than we need probably, because our water levels came up 30 feet. But look at our pumping cost. And I, I wish I could, and I'll compare it to what we have up here on the top. We had $32 when we were our most efficient point. Now we have $25, even though this pump is not as efficient. That's because it always costs more to lift water more or create more pressure. That's why so many people with drip systems and things are looking at lower pressure systems that they can, because it costs more. So, you know, you wanna be, you gotta take the water from where it is. If it was a hundred, if it's a hundred feet deep or whatever, you gotta go get that water and you gotta lift it to the surface and you're gonna have to create a pump with a horsepower that will do that. But this shows what happens with a variable or fluctuating water table. Like I said, now this is pretty dramatic what I showed here. Generally, it's not going to happen over a one year period, but it certainly happens over many years. And in some areas where the aquifer is not recharging well, it's dropping down and it's not coming back. It, it, we're losing ground all the time. So this condition I showed you 
could be happening and often, but often it is not. And I'd rather deal with the right side of the curve where you got a little more flow than you need and you give up a little efficiency because the cost went down. Now, that also means that if you have a pressurized irrigation system, you might be overpressurizing your system. And so that cost may not drop as much as you think. This would be more for like just dumping the water into a reservoir and picking it up. Like a deep well pump dumps in a reservoir and you have a booster pump create pressure in that, from that system. So, okay. So that's a variable or fluctuating water table. Um, the next thing I want to show is a stable operating condition. Um, where, and we'll use the same pump. I don't know why I turned it off, actually. Let's turn it back on. There it goes. Turning it back on now. Um, let's look at our situation. Let's start over here. Now, this is where the water level doesn't vary much. Let's say this pump was coming out of a reservoir instead. We got it dialed in. We got it dialed in at our most efficient point. Pretty good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that, mark that spot right there. So we're running about $32 an acre foot, about 57% efficient right at that spot. It's about our most efficient point. Now, a lot of people coming out of reservoir, they're, they're supplying their drip system or whatever, or canal, whatever it is, the water level is not going to change by more than a couple feet, a few feet. Not going to make dramatic changes there because you're going to keep the reservoir at one level. However, we probably are filtering the water. So let's look at our big pressure gauge up on top. So right now we're running about 40 pounds of pressure. Can't really see it that well, but, uh, it, um, but it's about 40 pounds. Oops, got my head in the way. There you go. That's 40 PSI. Let's say we're filtering the water. We're not paying attention to our flush outs very well on the filtration. I'm going to add about five pounds pressure. You might not even notice five pounds pressure. Now look what happened. Our flow rate that was running about 103 was, is now down to 85 because we added about 10 feet ahead or 12 feet ahead. We were at 93 or something. Now we're at 105. Our efficiency is still pretty good, but look at our cost. It went from 31, let's mark this spot, to 36. So the next example, even with a stable situation, if you're filtering your water and you're not flushing your tanks properly or you're having a bad design of your filtration system or something, that could be causing pressure loss. And over the course of the year, if you're paying an extra five, six dollars an acre foot and you're doing that over and you're pumping three acre feet per acre to irrigate your crop, that's an extra 18, 20 bucks an hour, uh, an acre for the season for your energy costs because you didn't flush your filters right or they weren't designed well and you have excessive pressure loss. That's why we always say try to keep your pressure loss below five PSI through your filtration as much as possible. Uh, because when you start getting up at 10 or 12 pounds, you're losing, that's a lot of pressure loss. So it's important, even with a stable water level, to be monitoring your pump and make sure something like this might not be occurring. And then if the filter continues to plug, exacerbates the problem, your water uh, drops off, your volume, your efficiency starts to drop off, all those things can occur, even with a stable condition. Or let's say you've designed a new irrigation system with that that was not set up with the right flow and pressure, you might be running way over the left side of your curve now. Uh, and if it's, it, it might give you the right flow and pressure, but if you're running way over here, that could be creating that condition. All right, I'm sorry, I'm almost out of time, so I gotta hurry here because didn't have enough time. All right. Um, Let's go back up to our most efficient point. I'm going to show one last thing, and we're going to have to call it a day because I'm going long. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to clear this off real quick. And actually, it looks like we have a raised hand. Is that right? Oh, Don't you got a raised hand. 
All right. Well, I can take a question. I got, I want, let me do one, my one last thing and I'll shut this off and then we'll talk. I'm not going to get to everything, okay. but okay. All right. So we're at a most efficient point or pretty close to it right there. Everything's working well. What if we come off our curve like this? Sometimes you come off your curve. Well, this could be an example of worn impellers. Like if you're pumping sand or something. Worn impellers, you'll come off your curve. I got an example of one here. I don't know if you can see, uh, this is worn out by sand. You see it's really thin and it's sharp and, and it's got pitting. It's, got, it's been had cavitation and all kinds of things on this impeller. This is a radio or closed impeller, different type. But anyway, that's what happens when this occurs. And of course, a lot of times with deep wells, we're pumping sand and the water level drops and that creates these situations. So you really can have some inefficiencies. The water level drops too. Now your efficiency is terrible and you have major issues, okay? Okay, we're out of time. Let's uh, go to the questions. Let me shut this down. Sure, well, and actually if you have, a, have a, you know, we'll do some questions if there's any other kind of last things you want to point out. Okay, we can go over a little bit over. Um, I'll call out, let's see, one question was submitted via the chat box from Tyler. So he's asking, what is the name of the software you're using to monitor pump efficiency in real time? This is just Microsoft Visual Basic and it's designed by us here. Now, there's a lot of uh, remote monitoring control companies now that are starting to do this. If you have a deep well pump, for example, you can put a, a sounding device, continuous sounding device down there, a bubbler or a, a air bubbler or a, uh, you know, an air pressure thing or a transducer type uh, thing. And you can monitor your well levels, take your discharge pressure times 2.31, add it to the lift and feed. And it's as the pump is running, it's not the static, it's the pumping water level as the pump is running. Then you've got total dynamic head. You have a flow meter for your flow rates and you have a power meter on your panel that tells you how much horsepower you're pulling you got efficiency and you could do continuous efficiency monitoring. And there's several companies or at least a few companies I know of here in California now, because I dealt with them. I worked with them to show them how they did it. And they've, they've incorporated it into their software. So you can have this type of uh, stuff on your pump system. Okay. okay, great. Yeah. Another one came in as well. Um, yes. So what's the minimal head above the pump to avoid pump wear out? Well, I mean, if you're a oh, okay. <laughs> well, it depends. Each pump is individual. Now you're getting into net pots of the suction head and cavitation and other things. Uh, the pitting on these impellers was probably caused by cavitation. And if you have, there's always a minimum head uh, on the pump current design. I didn't show that because again, we didn't. I knew we didn't have enough time to go into all that. But that would be in a more advanced class on pump efficiency. Um, uh, talking about, you know, it's it's individual for every impeller. I mean, some impellers, the open impellers are made to have almost virtually no head pressure. Um, so, and they don't wear out. So it just depends on the design of the impeller. Uh, but on these radio or closed impellers, certainly there is a, a, that is absolutely a factor when you're trying to design your pump system. Okay, great. And then um, Ahmed, I had you come off mute. I think you had your hand raised. Did you want to ask yes. a question? Yeah. Yes. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Excellent presentation. Um, as a grower, uh, what kind of be the things that makes me suspect that I have a problem in my pump or my irrigation system? So flow would be one indicator, pressure would be another indicator. But what makes me suspect that I have to take my pump, get to your center to check it, and if I want to replace it or not? Yeah. Well, there's, you can get your pumps tested. There's, in, at least in California, and I think all over the United States, there's pump efficiency testers that, that take their equipment out there and they'll give you the efficiency, at least a snapshot of that day. Uh, I, 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 the flow meter and the pressure gauge is the two things that really I pay attention to. You have a flow and pressure requirement for your irrigation system. So if you're not meeting that, then you have to suspect that you've got issues, especially if you once met it. If, if and when you initially installed the pump system, you needed uh, 800 gallons a minute with, uh, you know, 40 pounds pressure and you're lifting the water, whatever, you know, you got, you get the idea uh, through your total dynamic head. So those are the two main ones that I watch. Now, uh, the getting your pump, then you can call a, a professional pump tester and say, okay, exactly where am I at? What's going on? The water level that you wouldn't know that uh, for sure what happened. You could have a worn pump. Uh, you wouldn't know the reason necessarily that it's worn out. But what you would do is you would get, you could have it tested 
and you check your water levels. And if you knew that, and if you do this every couple of years is what we tell people in California, this get your pumps tested every few years. Um, then you see those water levels dropping, then you can suspect that you got a variable or fluctuating water table. And that may be part of the problem. The other part might be sand wearing the pump out too. So at that point though, it doesn't really matter necessarily what the cause is, you have to deal with what your new condition is and you have to size and put a new pump in that, that works for you at that situation. Sometimes it could be just adding a stage. If your water level dropped 20 feet, if you have enough motor there uh, that can horsepower in the motor, it can take it. You can add one stage. You notice on my diagrams, I had like three stages. I've seen pumps with 16 stages. Mm -hmm. And so you could do a lot of things like that. And I'll let Dr. Vang describe what they do in the certification here because they don't actually do repairs and stuff here, but go, go ahead. Yeah, comment. primarily what we do here is verification of its equipment is actually functioning efficiently or correctly. So for like pumps, we'll test it for municipalities and also farmers, and we identify if the pump is actually operating at its best efficiency point or is off the curve, or if it's just not producing the amount of water that... Um, that the manufacturer claims it does. So we're actually like a third party verifier evaluator. We don't, um, and sometimes they bring it here before they send it out to the cities and towns to make sure that they're operating at the claimed um, efficiency point. And that's kind of what, what our charge here is to identify and make sure that um, we're being able to represent the growers and the customer. Yeah, it, it's 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 just usually to do it. It costs a lot more money to put it in the ground, find out it doesn't produce, than it does to bring it to a lab and double check it first, and then put it in the ground. And hopefully, then you can identify if there's a well problem with the well or some other issue, maybe. But that's the point. So that's what uh, Calmine does here: is they certify the pumps that they are meeting certain standards before you install them. Generally, I guess you could install them and then pull them out. That costs a lot of money to do. I'd do it first. <laughs> that's good. Thank you much. You bet. Great. And then I'm um, just looking over at the chat box quickly. I don't see any other questions and I don't see any other hands raised. So I think um, I think we're about done. Any other kind of last comments from either of you? No, thank you for coming in the VFD one. I'm going to I will have to go through a little bit of the basics again because there'll be different audience maybe. But the VFD, we're going to just I'm going to basically assume that if most people hopefully came to this one today or know about this stuff, because once we go to the VFD one, I'm going to do a bunch of examples and I don't want to waste too much time going through basic pumps again. So we will cross a few things, but welcome, yep. hopefully you'll come back in a couple hours or an hour. Yeah, great. Thank so, um, so thank you to everyone for joining us and a big thank you to both Bill and Calmine for leading this session. Um, as I just mentioned, the introduction to VFDs, which kind of piggybacks on this session, will begin at 2 p.m. Eastern. So as a reminder, each session does have its own unique Zoom link. So please be sure to use the correct link if you are joining us for that second session later today. And then I think that is it. So thank you everyone for joining us. And a final thank you to our sponsors, both Rainbird and Senator. So have a nice day or we will see you later on this afternoon. Thank you, everybody.